The eye is only about one inch in length, but it is our window to our world through the sense of vision. The transparent lens on the ocular surface is the cornea, and this is covered by the tear film, which is a vital component to good vision, despite being only one-tenth of the thickness of a human hair. It is made up of three principal layers. The oily lipid layer on the top prevents evaporation. The bulk is the aqueous watery layer, and it is held on the ocular surface by the mucin and glycocalyx. The tear film functions include allowing us to see clearly between blinks, with each blink restoring clear vision if the tear film is drying up, removal of loose debris that falls on the ocular surface, fighting infection with antimicrobial agents it contains, and keeping the surface cells hydrated, restoring the transparency of the cornea and maintaining the comfort of the tissues which the most nerves per square millimetre in your body. So how can dry eye be caused? Well, along with ageing and hormonal changes, dry eye can be caused by environmental conditions such as wind and sun, preservatives in eye drops and non-optimal contact lenses, and even staring at digital devices. So what does research tell us about the underlying process that causes dry eye disease? Tear evaporation leads to tear loss, which increases the osmolarity, or saltiness, of the tear film. This causes inflammation of the ocular surface, which leads to damage, which destabilizes the tear film still further, leading to a vicious cycle of disease. Hence, dry eye is not a short-term condition. Our recent research starts at the cellular layer, showing that the saltiness of the tear film as it increases, the ocular surface becomes more susceptible to UV light damage. We have designed and validated new instruments to better diagnose the disease, some for opticians and optometrists, and others that can be used in pharmacies or even at home, such as this app. You just answer a few questions and stare at the screen, timing until your eyes first feel uncomfortable. We have also developed and validated treatments, such as masks you heat in the microwave to allow the eyelid glands to restore the lipid oil layer of the tear film, and nano-thickness coatings to maintain the good health properties of the contact lens while creating a more slippy surface, increasing their comfort. So do come to the Royal Society exhibit if you can, and be part of live, ongoing research to make sure that there is not a dry eye in the house. Tear film is a thin transparent layer on top of the ocular surface to fit it, protect it, remove debris, keep it hydrated and transparent. It's produced mainly by the lacrimal gland called the watery component and the mebumin glands located in the upper and lower eyelid for the oily layer, which prevents its evaporation and keeps the tear film stable. Each blink action squeezes its glands, replenishing the tear film and picking up the tears running along the eyelid margin to cover up the ocular surface. Hence, our research focuses on developing techniques and instrumentation to detect the first disruption of the tear film. We're as well developing models to stimulate the tear film using biological tissue and advanced engineering techniques to better understand the role of experimental treatment and also we run clinical studies to determine how common this disease is, the risk factors that influence it, and to try new possible treatments. So at the Royal Society in 2018, not only did we present our latest data to the people attending, but we also collected data on their eye comfort, their risk factors, uh, their ability to blink and hold their eye open comfortably, which is a test that we validated alongside clinical data of their tear stability, the volume of lake of the tears, and also imaging their glands, presenting them with a unique memento, a memory stick with their data, but allowing us to do some advanced analysis. Of the thousands of um, visitors we had to the exhibition, over 1,400 willingly provided data, including 625 children and young adults. We're particularly interested in this age group because we're finding that dry eye, which used to be considered a disease of the older age, is becoming more and more common in young people, and especially with the use of computers and digital devices. 
This is a worry because the disease is known to progress over time and affects quality of life. When the oil glands are lost, the tear film quality becomes increasingly poor and this leads to debilitating symptoms and ultimately to damage to the eye's surface. Our data from the Royal Society confirmed high rates of dry eye in young individuals. Dry eye disease was found uh, to be more common in females and present in around 20% of those under the age of 16 and around 30% of those aged between 16 and 20. More than one quarter of the eye's normal glands uh, were missing in over 18% of the younger age group, rising to around 20% of those aged between 16 and 20. And this was linked to screen time. The odds of developing dry eye, or losing one quarter of the eyelid glands, increases by 20% with every two extra hours of screen time use per day highlighting a potential risk in the younger generation that we feel is deserving of further attention. My name is Francesco Mangoni, and as a biomedical engineer, we have developed a fluid flow system to maintain the physiological integrity of a porcine eye, a waste product of meat production, as if it was still alive, to allow us to test the impact of the environment on coaching dry eye and the effectiveness of dry eye symptoms. My name is Tuche Peck and as a biologist we have used Porsana model that has been developed and have revealed damaging combination of ultraviolet light and dry eye as unstable TFM is less able to protect the ocular surface. Hence, UV light exposure will make dry eye worse and dry eye will allow UV light to do more damage to the transparent window of the eye that allows you high quality of vision. My name is Duga Jar, and as a pharmacist, we have also used the porcine eye model that has been developed and human cell lines to examine some new formulations of artificial tears that better represent the natural tear film. We have been able to show the beneficial effects these can have compared to current commercial products on allowing the damaged ocular surface to heal and for wounds to repair. My name is Alberto Recchio. And as a clinician, working in collaboration with the Nice Surgery Center, we have been examining the impact of cataract surgery and laser refractive surgery on the ocular from face. Through our evidence-based approach, our primary aim was to understand the role of dry eye in patients attending those surgeries by discovering the most reliable indicators, which were also useful to assess how newer forms of key old type surgery can prevent postoperative dry eye. Hi, my name is Maria Vidal and as a clinical optometrist, we have been doing a more detailed clinical examination than we did at the Royal Society 2018 exhibition, considering representative study populations of the UK, Spain and New Zealand. This research confirms how common dry eye disease is affecting this one third of the adult population. It helped us to identify the dry subtypes and the risk factors and makes you likely to suffer from the disease. So in conclusion, our research has shown that dry eye is a common condition affecting about a third of the population in adulthood, not just in the elderly, but also in the young whose continuous screen use is damaging the glands that produce that tear film. So working together as a multidisciplinary team with international collaborators, we are able to make a real difference in this chronic debilitating disease.